Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another time of Bible teaching. A couple of things before we start. I've got a little bit of a sinus cold, a little sore throat stuff. So if you see me like grabbing a uh, throat lozenger or, you know, drinking or, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I'll try not to make it too gross. Um, but I'm good. I'm fine. It's just, you know, one of these things that comes up. Second, this should go out on Monday. Um, so that means the following week that I will be out of town, going to go a little time. Ocean City, New Jersey. Yeah, New Jersey, like America's armpit. No, no, southern New Jersey. So cool. But we're heading up there for a few days for the week. Um, so I'm hoping to have all these videos recording to go out during that time. Um, and I may not be as quick getting back or responding. But um, I'll still be around, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to keep recording videos, just letting you know ahead of time. Okay, so today we're talking about the wheat and tares, Armageddon, and the mark of the beast, because the mark of the beast is going to show up in the places that we're going. Wow, this is actually going to be really cool, tying some stuff together. Um, so let's start with the wheat and the tares. So we're going to go to back to Matthew 13. But in, under, in order to understand Matthew 13, we need to understand what happened in Matthew 12 that sets it up. So let's open up our Bibles to Matthew 12. Okay. Um, here you have a confrontation between uh, Messiah and the Pharisees. Nothing new. They, it happens all the time, right? All right, so we're going to start here in verse 22. One was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind, and mute. And he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And the multitudes were amazing, saying, Could this be the son of David? The son of David is the um, Messiah bin David, the, the, the Mashiach, the Savior. And David is the conquering king. He would have been the conquering king if they had not rejected him. Hold on one minute. Yeah, if Israel had not rejected him, Messiah would have been the conquering king right there, the son of David. And guess what? We're looking at the part where Israel rejects him. But why are the multitudes so amazed? Well, this man was mute. He's deaf. Can't speak, can't talk, can't hear. Um, so... It, you would always talk the demons out. I'm going to find something that's kind of funny. Give me a second. It's actually kind of a funny verse in Acts 19.13. Um, see, it wasn't that big of a deal to cast the demon out. Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, so they had traveling Jewish exorcists, took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the name Jesus, who Paul teaches. That's kind of funny. I mean, obviously, if you find something that works, you use it in the name. That name has power. But the difference here is in what we're looking at is that this person is can't hear. And it was known that only the Messiah could um, throat, cast a demon out of somebody that can't hear. So the multitudes are amazed. You notice how the multitudes already got, always got what the Pharisees, Sadducees, and everybody couldn't, what the ruling elite could not see. Now the Pharisees heard it and said, this fellow does not cast out demon except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. What power is Messiah working under? Remember the dove came down on his shoulder? He's working under the power of the Holy Spirit. They're saying that he's working, the, the Pharisees are saying that he's working under the power of demons. The ruler of demons, saint. Um, not good. So let's just skip down. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. 
And this is the unpardonable sin, the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. And at this point, Israel corporately rejects Messiah because a nation is judged by its rulers. And I really hope that I'm out of here and we're raptured before I get judged because I don't want to get judged based on the rulers of my country. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not good. So what happens is in the next chapter, chapter 13, Messiah begins to talk in parables. And he will continue to talk in parables, and he will not he will not again talk to like really large crowds, except for in parables. Um, and we're gonna go down here a little bit just to see briefly uh prophecy and parables. Yeah, that's not gonna get it to us. We're gonna go here. The purpose of parables. Uh, give me a second. Here we go. Starting in verse 10. And the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That's a sowed mystery of the kingdom of heaven. Because it is, um, But to them it has not. For whoever has, to him more will be given. For he will have abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In other words, they didn't get who I am. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, saying, Hearing you will hear and not understand, seeing you will see but not perceive. For the hearts of these people have grown dull. And the eyes are hard of hearing, or excuse me, the ears are hard of hearing. And their eyes, they are closed. At least they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. At least they should understand with their hearts and turn or repent so that I will hear them. Excuse me, so I should heal them. So blessed are you that, you're, that, you, that your eyes for your eyes, I'm sorry, I just saw something go by outside. Blessed are you, uh, blessed are your eyes, for they are, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For surely I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So what's interesting and this is what's called, like when you're filled with the Spirit and you're discerning the Word correctly and you're understanding all these things, that is having ears to hear. Many do not. And you'll see things that said, if for those who have hear, ears to hear. You know, in Revelation, the, the, um, in the letters to the churches, it just says, for those who have ears, let them hear. That's for everybody. Um, the ruling elite, the ones that everybody looked at as like the most spiritual, the most godly, the most um, knowledgeable, whatever, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. I believe it's the same way today. Anyhow, so you have four parables that we're going to look at briefly here. You have the parable of the sower. This is just seed put in different places. That's heart conditions. Um in particular, I want to look at one verse here and the seed that was fell by the wayside, like on a roadway, and the birds came and devoured them. And there are different places, and only the seed that fell in the good soil um, actually grew. Now, we're going to look at the mustard seed in, this, in the parable of the leaven, and then we'll come back to the wheat, wheat and tares, and that's where we're going to go off of from there. But you'll notice that the wheat and tares, how does it start? The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in a field. The kingdom of heaven, the millennial kingdom, all right? So the mustard seed, another parable was put forth saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed in which a man took and sowed into the field, in which is the least of all the seeds but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds in the air come to uh, come and 
and nests in its branches. Oh, the pretty little birds. Isn't that cool? I know. Birds can be so cool. But in this case, guess what? It's not. We got to go back to verse 15, explaining the parable of the sower and that seed that was by the wayside that we read about. I have 15. It doesn't look like it. No, give me a second. Uh, okay, we read that the birds were the ones that took the seeds. So anyone hears the king, the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, that's the seed that was on the wayside. Then the wicked one comes and snatches it away, what was sown in the, his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. So what we saw down here is that these birds, the ones that are snatching up the, the, the seed, this is the churches. This is this tiny seed that's being planted, the church. It's going to grow to be the biggest thing in the garden. Lots of different branches, lots of different denominations. And Satan's going to make his home in all of them. Okay. Next we have the parable of the leaven. Where does the, where does, it says another parable he spoke. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like, um, and again, the mustard seed, the kingdom of heaven is like, the meal, where did the meal came from? The meal came from the seed, which grew up into the wheat, which when they harvested, they made the meal out of, okay? This is a continual thing. What is leaven? Pagan idolatry, not following God. Worshipping Baal. What's the big deal about worshipping Baal? It's a foreign god, and Baal means husband. Can you imagine ladies out there or men? If, if uh, ladies are out there worshiping somebody else and they're calling them husband, how would you feel? Yeah. All right. It's serious. Anyhow, but so, and it's all of it. Um, um, a, the par another parable he spoke to them. Like, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who took and hid three le three measures. Um, of, and, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble. I'm like so thinking about where I'm going to go with this. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Leaven gets in, puffs, 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 puffs us up with pride. It's idolatry. It's doing it our way. And no, I'm not thinking about Tony Bennett. I did it my way. Anyhow. It's not good, but this is the churches and the churches teaching lawlessness. This is synagogues. Did you know the synagogues don't teach from Torah for the most part? They don't teach the prophets. For the most part, the synagogues are teaching the commandments of men, the Talmud, not good. M Messiah warned about that. And actually, it's come from Isaiah as well. So let's get in. I know I'm taking longer than I thought I would here. Let's get into the wheat and tares, and then we're going to get into Armageddon. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Who's the man? Messiah. Who's the seed? That's the word of God. Who's the field? Or what's the field? That's the world. This is the gospel of Messiah. Yeah, Paul doesn't have a gospel. This is the gospel of, somebody was telling me that they believe the gospel of Paul. So he doesn't have one. Messiah does. Um, who sowed into the world. But while men slept, an enemy came. Who's the enemy? That's Satan. But the men slept. His enemy came and sowed tares among them, among the wheat and went on his way. This is pagan idolatry. These are people who are filled with pagan idolatry in the churches, growing together in the church side by side. So next time you're at church, look, is that a tear? Is that a tear? What, is that a tear? You don't know. And even if it's a tear today, it might not be a tear tomorrow. We'll talk about that in a second. 
But why did it happen? People slept. They let the pagan idolatry slip into the church, to seep into the church, like a snake that crawls under the door or seeps through a little crack somewhere and worked its way in. And there, this is telling us there's some real issues. By the time Messiah comes back, um, how many hours is that left now? Soon. Everything in the churches is going to be full of pagan idolatry. Jeremiah talks about this. Jeremiah 16, 19. Anyhow, let's keep going. But when the grain had sprouted and produced the crop, then the tares appeared. So the angels came to the, um, of the servants of the owners came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. Satan has done it. The servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them up? Gather up the tares. No, he said. No, least while you gather up tares, you may also uproot the wheat with them. And there's two ways to look at it. You, could, you ever been in a garden doing some weeding and you pull out a weed, but the weed has roots and you end up pulling out something good at the same time? I have. But you know what? They look a lot alike. And you might pull out a tear that's really wheat. Or it could be a tear today at that point. But you know what? Next year, next month, next week, that tear could become wheat and find Messiah. So he's saying, wait till the harvest of the last day. Then do it. But he said, no, least... While you gather up the tares, you also up to uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them and gather the wheat into my barns. Who gets gathered up first here? Well, yeah, the, uh, the tares. Do they get burned right away? Not necessarily. Hold on. Excuse me. To bind them into bundles, to burn them, and to gather the wheat into my barn. We got to understand something with parables. Parables are intended to give points to a story, to emphasize certain things. It is not to be like, you know, a play-by-play -play commentator for a football game, giving you every angle, showing you another view, telling you what happened, telling you what's going to happen. That's not what parables do. Parables tell you little bits by bits. And people try to take this to say, oh, well, there's no rapture because the tares get pulled out first. Doesn't work that way. Uh, rapture is beforehand, and the harvest is over a seven-year period. Actually, it's longer than that because you, a harvest has three parts. The first fruits was Messiah and all the saints that came out of the graves with Messiah. That was the first fruits because Messiah is the first fruits of the resurrection of life. Then you have the main harvest, the rapture, the beginning of tribulation. And at the end of tribulation, you have the tribulation saints plus those that are in Petra, and there will still be some alive people. And that's the remnant of Israel that's still in Petra, about a third of the, of the Jews. But you'll have some live people that will walk into the kingdom of heaven. You don't, there's not really a scripture for that, but it just seems obvious that there is. So you, I could actually say it's my opinion that there will be people who survive and stay alive during tribulation who walk into the kingdom of heaven. All right. So let's look real quick at the explanation of it. Thus Jesus sent the multitudes away and went into, into the houses. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. He answered there for them and said, He who sows good seed is the Son of Man, Messiah. And the field is the world. The, the good seeds are the, um, of the, are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. You getting this? Therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. That's at the end of the thousand years of millennial kingdom. So it will be at the end of this age. 
the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Don't miss that, those who practice lawlessness, that's the condition of being without Torah by choice or ignorance. Practice lawlessness. You're working at it. A lot of people are. And will cast them into the furnace of fire. That's, that's the um, lake of fire. Where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Not good. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. What's interesting. Wow, I never picked this one up. And then with their father when is it that we shine like stars and we reign with the father in the kingdom of their father that's the new heavens and new earth because must god the father will not be in the millennial kingdom he will be in the new heavens and new earth let me show that to you go ahead and turn to revelation 22 um, in Revelation 21, leading up to this, we had the new heavens, new earth, and you also had the new Jerusalem. But as we're continuing reading about the river of life, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Both the God and God's throne and Messiah's throne will be in it and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. You know, so up to this point, if you see his face, you're dead. Nobody wants to see his face. Uh, there are times that seeking his face is associated with learning about him. But, you know, seeing his face, that's a big no-no. But we'll be able to see his face at this point. All right. Let's go back. I kind of love these things. And again, a time like this, in the middle of doing a teaching, I'm seeing something I hadn't quite caught before. That when we're looking at, in Revelation 13, and again, this is new for me, in the explanation of the wheat and the tares, specifically talking about let them grow together until the harvest. At the time of the harvest, I will say the reapers first gather together the tares and bind them into bundles and burn them and then gather the wheat into my barn. Hold on, I'm sorry. It's 43. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to let him hear. Yeah, this is it. That's Psalm the millennium. That's the new heavens and new earth. So when is this harvest that happens? That's Armageddon. And we're going to read about it where? Math, um, Revelation 14. But, but Revelation 14 should be the middle of tribulation. Yeah, no, it's not. But it is. Let's look. All right, Revelation 12 is pretty much smack dab in the middle of, of tribulation. Then you're going to have Revelation 13 and 14. 12, 13, 14. Yeah, that's the order it goes into. Like, Revelation 13, you get all, all of the stuff about, like, the beast out of the sea, the beast on the earth, you know, the false prophet, um, the Antichrist, Satan's going to come down. These are, and this is where it talks about the mark of the beast, where it's going to try to get people to get the mark of the beast. This is what they intend to do during the second half of tribulation. This is an introduction to the Great Tribulation just as Revelation 14 is. And you're going to see that in a second. Okay, in Revelation 14, we're going to go through this. I'm not going to hit every verse and explain everything here, but we're going to go through it. Then I looked and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000, having his father's name written on the forehead. Uh, I believe that's the end of tribulation. And the 144,000 have a seven-year ministry. We see that back in Revelation 7. And when we talked about Revelation 7 in our teaching series in Revelation, we talked about how it was a, a parenthesis covering the entire seven years of tribulation. Um, look, read verse, well, let's go to verse 9. 
After these things, look and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with the palm branches in their hands. And a lot of people look at this and say, Aha, there's the rapture. Hold on. No, this is the work of the 144,000 witnesses throughout the seven years of tribulation. How do we know that? We read the context. We keep reading. Like verses, um, what, 13 and 14. One of the elders answered, saying to me, Who were these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Great answer. Yeah, if you ever have an angel or a heavenly body, you know, you get raptured and somebody asks you a question, what is this? Sir, you know. In other words, oh, you, you tell me, you know. And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That whole thing about the whiteness here, I want you to remember it, because we're going to talk about it a little later. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. But anyhow, these are coming out of the great tribulation. So it's during the great tribulation that so many will be saved. So let's keep going through here. And I heard a voice of heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. And sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures, the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 that were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women. And they are virgins. And they are ones who fo follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And their mouth was found no deceit, for they were without fault before the throne of God. Guess what? They missed the rapture, and then they came to Messiah. Otherwise, they would they would have been, you know, raptured up and have um, resurrect, they'd have resurrected and have the imperishable bodies so they would be completely, they wouldn't be men, men, like we would know it. All right, let's keep going through here. We're going to skip down to eight. Another angel followed, saying, Babylon, Babylon has fallen, the great city, because she has made nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Does that happen here? Is it like in the midpoint tribulation where Babylon falls? No, it's not. Go to Revelation 18.2. Oh, that's not it. Go to Revelation 18.2. And cried with a... And um, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great authority... And the earth was illuminated with his glory, and he cried mightily in a loud voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Understand that there is a physical Babylon from way back that fell long, long ago. There's a spiritual Babylon. And, and we're going to talk more about this. We get into like places like Revelation 13, Revelation 17. We're going to get into a lot more of this when we get into that in the Bible study. But there is a Babylon in the world today that will fall. Um, you'll, you'll also see verses about Babylon falling in, well, the, the one interesting one is in Jeremiah 51, 6 and 7. We're not going there. But this is where it talks about the golden cup that you see in Revelation 7, 8. Um, I'm sorry, in Revelation 7, 4. Let's keep going on. Back to Revelation 14. Okay. 
Here we go. And then a third of the angels followed them, saying in a loud voice, If anybody worships the beast in his image and receives the mark on the forehead or on his hand. The fact that this is here, looking at the second half of tribulation, tells you that the mark of the beast comes about during the Great Tribulation, during the second half of tribulation. I've seen people that are worried, oh, did I take the mark of the beast? No, you haven't. You couldn't have. It's not here yet. It will not come until three and a half years after the rapture. Now, if you're going to write letters to people that might be in your home after you get raptured and you talk about the mark of the beast, please do me a favor. Do them a favor. Don't say that the mark of the beast is a tattoo, a vaccine, a microchip, whatever it may be. And you know what? There are 17 people out there right now that have 17 different ideas of what that mark of the beast is. And I've been doing this since 2007, and I can't even begin to list all of the things that were definitely the mark of the beast. Um. Where does the mark of the beast go? Hand, forehead. Um, who's involved in, do, in, in getting you to get it? The false prophet and the Antichrist. What is another name for the Antichrist? The man of lawlessness. What is lawlessness? The condition of being without Torah by choice or, of, or ignorance. Go to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. The Shema, one of the most important things. In Judaism, oh, hear, hear, O Israel. That's a direct, that's a command statement. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is one of the two most important things that Messiah talked about and all the rest of the prophets and, and law to, the, hang on them. They're not done away, they hang on them. And these are the words I command you today that you shall keep in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down. This is about Torah that they're talking about. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and on your forehead. The law is supposed to be bound on the hand and the forehead. The man of lawlessness is going to have this mark that if you take it, you can't buy and sell, and it's going to go on the hand and the forehead. Coincidence? I don't think so. You tell me. Let's go back to Revelation. Yeah, I don't believe in coincidences. All right. Get down here a little further. We're going to get to the harvest in a little bit. So let's just jump down to verse 14. Then I looked, and behold... A white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come to reap the harvest the, of the earth is ripe. So he who sat in the cloud thrust his sickle onto the earth, and the earth was reaped. What's the cloud? Anybody know? What is the cloud? And it's a white cloud. Come on, somebody out there has got the answer. Go to First Thessalonians 5. Excuse me, to First Thessalonians 4. Verse 15, 16. For the Lord himself would ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. Then we who are alive shall remain and shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So we're raptured into the clouds, and he's going to come back on the clouds. How do I know that? I do, and we'll go there in a minute. I want to point out one thing here. Voice of an archangel. Let's look at the tools. I think it's voice. I could be wrong. Pretty sure it's the word voice. Yeah, it is. 
What does that mean? It means voice. Okay. Just give me a second. Um, well, this is shout. Look at the word shout. It's an order, a command, okay? It's a command statement. The only place where I see a command statement in, in regard to the rapture is Revelation 4.1 that flat out says, come up here. Come up here. Come up to heaven. That's a command. All right. So we're looking at the clouds. We saw that we get caught up into the clouds. And so let's go to Zechariah 14b. Or for 14, 5, um, second part of the verse. Zechariah 14, 5. Thus the Lord, my God, will come and all the saints with you. Uh, if, you got, if you're using a paper Bible, hold your place here. We're going to come back to this verse, or this chapter. So when Messiah comes back, all the saints come back with him. We read about that in Revelation 19. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it, on him, was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flames of fire. What does fire represent? Come on, you know. Judgment. And on his head were many crowns. That's because it, back in Revelation 4 and 5, we cast off the crowns to him. He had a name written on him which no one knew except himself. Nope, I don't know it. And he was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Keep that in mind, the robe dipped in blood. We're going to see that a little later. And his name was called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on horses. Okay, so when he comes back and all the saints with him were this army clothed in white Fine, white, clean linen. Why? Because we were imputed righteousness. The, our linen, our, um, these are the bridal um, garments that the Father would give. This means that we are holy, blameless, spotless, uh, without flaws, without defects, because we were washed in the blood of the Lamb. Period. But you notice he's got blood on him, and we don't. What does that mean? We'll tell you in a minute. So when he came back on the white clouds, these are we're the white clouds. There's so many people coming back with him. It looks like a cloud, and it's a heavenly white. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. What is that sword? It's the word of God. That with it, he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And we'll come back to 15 again. So hold a place here. So, hmm, where do I want to go from here? I think we need to go to, give me a second. Um, let's go to Matthew 24. I think I'm a little out of order, but that's okay. Maybe I'm supposed to go out of order. Maybe I was out of order in my outline. Uh, Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31. Immediately after tribulation of those days. By the way, this is a post-tribber's like, downfall, these verses. Sorry about that. I should have paused. Immediately after tribulation of those days of the sun, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven, and the power of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and, uh, great, with power and great glory. We're coming with him. These are all the tri raptured and tribulated tri ah. The raptured, 
um, saints are coming with him. The raptured and resurrected saints are all coming with him at this point. We are that cloud of white. It's the great cloud of witnesses. We're coming back with him at this point. After, immediately after tribulation. And he will send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. This is, um, we're not going to go there, but Isaiah 11, gathering everybody into the promised land where Messiah sets himself up as a banner. Um, elsewhere, it says from the four corners of the earth as well. And even the Gentiles will seek him. And this is gathering everybody into the millennial kingdom after tribulation. There's something else in here, a couple of things. All right, do you see where it says the great, where does it say? The great sound of a trumpet right here, great sound of a trumpet. That great sound of a trumpet is, is blown on Yom Kippur. That's the day at the end of tribulation. Rosh Hashanah is the rapture, Yom Kippur is Armageddon, and this is one of the ways you know that. You also can see it in Joel 2. Uh, so now, who is it that's seeing the Son of Man coming and mourning about it? The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. Tribes of the earth. Okay, what is prophetically, what does earth mean? Israel, what is seas, Gentiles, tribes, Israel. This is the raptured and reser excuse me. This is the trib um, remnant of Israel that have been hidden away in Petra. They're seeing this. Where do we see them mourning? Try, let's go to Zechariah 12. Um, verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look it upon me, as he's coming back in the clouds, whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And you can read down here, and it talks about how everybody's going to mourn by themselves individually. Um, but this is on Armageddon that this happens. Right, give me a second. So let's go back to Matthew uh, on Revelation 14. This harvest is in the last days. This is Armageddon. Let's read the rest of it out. And the harvest of the wheat and the harvest of the grapes are basically kind of the same thing. Told in two different ways. It's kind of like Hebraic poetry, where you say the same thing in different ways. It doesn't have to rhyme. Hebraic poetry doesn't rhyme. It just says the same thing in different ways to give you a fuller understanding. I was talking to one of my Orthodox Jewish customers, and I was talking about a verse in the New Testament. I said, it says this and this, and he said, hey, break poetry. They said it twice, and the guy looked at me, he's like, twice? A lot of times it's three, four, five, six times. They say the same thing the same way, so you understand better. Anyhow, so let's look at the reaping of the grapes of wrath. Why do I think Veggie Tales when I hear about the grapes of wrath? Then another angel came out of the temple, um, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the altar, who had power over fire, judgment, and, the, and, and cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. And I've seen people take this verse as a good thing. Let's keep reading. And the angel thrust in a sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. 
and the wine press was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out um, of the wine press up to the horses' bridles. That's pretty high for one thousand six hundred furlongs. That's like two hundred twenty miles. That's like the length of Israel today. That's a lot of blood. A lot of people getting killed off in Armageddon. But why do we read about Armageddon in Revelation 14? Because this is an introduction to the Great Tribulation. It tells you what's going to happen in Tribulation. So, from here, let's go back to Revelation 19, verse 5. I'm um, sorry, give me a second. In verse 15, I know, I know that didn't look right. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that's the word of God, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. This is where this is happening. This is Armageddon after the end of tribulation. And he who has on his robes, on his thighs, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. By the way, this is not a tattoo. Uh, tattoos are not uh, biblically cool. Um, it is where the prayer shawl would come down to. If you had the prayer shawl, the tallit around your neck, and it's coming down, it comes down to about the thigh. So do we get any other information on this wine press? We certainly do. Let's go to... That um, Isaiah 63. Remember how we didn't have any blood on us, but he did? That's explained for us here, kind of. Um, verse 2 through 6. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the winepress? I have treaded the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled on my garments. I have stained all of my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redemption has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there, were no, there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me. What's that word for salvation? Yeshua, Jesus, it's Yeshua. And my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk in my fury and brought down their strength to the earth. Wow. So where else was a good place to go to look at how this happens. How does Armageddon happen? Hmm. Let's go to Psalm 2 and see what David has to tell us about it. Understand that all of these nations are going to be gathered for battle against Jerusalem. It's in the Armageddon which is Mount Megiddo area. There's a plain. It's a gathering place. That's where they gather, and they're going to go down the Jezreel Valley to go to Jerusalem. I think um, Napoleon once said that this place would be like the perfect battlefield, like the ultimate battlefield. And they're coming because they know Messiah is coming, and they want to stop him from taking his throne. Um, they are directed by the Antichrist. And as we've learned, we'll, we'll probably see more that there will be demon-like creatures that are egging them on. Not, not virtually or not visually, but still urging them on. <laughs> Hold on. So why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? What does vain mean? It's going to come to nothing. Worthless. It's not going to come to fruition. And the kings of the earth set themselves up. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, against God and against Messiah. Here's what they want. Let us break their bonds and pieces and cast away their cords. They don't want them to rule. 
He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Derision is a laugh. That's kind of like if you see somebody doing some something so stupid, so ridiculous, that they're, you know they're going to get hurt, and it's not going to go well for them. But you just look at it, and you just laugh. And it's not like a that's really funny laugh. You just sort of laugh like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I'm seeing this kind of laugh. That's derision. Then he shall speak to him in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure. That's Armageddon, that little verse right there. That's it. It's over. He speaks with the word that with the sword coming out of his mouth, it's over. He's going to do it on the way down with the saints behind him. Over. We're not fighting. What's the next line? Yet I have set my king on my hill of Zion. That's um, Ezekiel 43, verse 7, where Messiah sits on the throne of David in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Need to wrap this up? So we're going to go back to one last place. We're going to go back to Zechariah 14. And it's going to look at something about what happens when Messiah speaks. Zechariah 14. Um, see, this is Armageddon. For I will gather the nations to battle against Jerusalem. You know, Gog and Magog, it's the Golan Heights. Um, Ezekiel, I mean, uh, Psalm 83, it's all of the borders that they're attacking. It's the Jerusalem is for Armageddon. All three wars, three different places. The city shall be rif uh, taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. That's what Muslims do when they conquer an area. Half the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in a day of battle. And that's with the sword coming out of his mouth. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which, feet, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move to the north and half to the south. Why? Anybody know why? Muslim guy, a long time ago, put a graveyard there blocked up the eastern wall or the eastern gate and put a graveyard thinking a good Jewish boy isn't going to walk through a graveyard to get there. He understood that Messiah is supposed to come back on the Mount of Olives and walk through the eastern gate. Guess what? He won't walk through the graveyard. The graveyard's going to go eh, with an earthquake. And we'll probably see this earth. We're going to see this earthquake in the book of Revelation later as we're working through that Bible study. Let's skip down, last verse, verse 12. And here's how Messiah wipes out people. Actually, i got one more verse I want to go to. And this shall be the plague for which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. This sound familiar? Like something you've seen before? No, 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 not in real life, but in the movies. Raiders of the Ark, Lost Ark with Indiana Jones, maybe? You think Steven Spielberg, a Jewish man, may have read this somewhere and got an idea for it? Hold on one second, I want to find a verse. But to close. We're going to go to Psalm 83 for one last verse to close with. Um, this is important. As we're getting close, and there's a chance that it could be less than less than a month and a half or about a month and a half until the rapture um, that we really need to be reaching out to people and even people that we don't think deserve it. Who knows? Maybe even maybe people don't get it now, but they get it during tribulation. They're part of that great multitude that gets saved as a, as a um, result of the ministry of those 144,000. I talked about the Muslims or whatever that will be coming against Israel 
In Armageddon, it's going to be a whole lot more than Muslims. And even Gog and Magog, it's going to be a whole lot more than Muslims. Because you probably got the Chinese mixed in, the Russians mixed in. And in Armageddon, it's all the nations of the earth. Yeah, all of them that are coming against them. But, you know, there's part of me that just wants to say, you know, God, smite them, God. Smite them, kill them. Get rid of them, God. That's not, that's the wrong attitude. Psalm 83, verse 16, fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. See, there is nobody deserving of salvation. Nobody. It's not something you deserve. It's not something you earn. It's a free gift. No, if you, when, when Messiah but the thing is that we love Messiah because he loved us first. And to love him, we should be obeying him afterwards. But we don't deserve this. We deserve a lake of fire. Maybe we deserve the right to see if we want to do the elementary uh, backstroke or the regular backstroke while we're in this lake of fire. Maybe we deserve that right. Maybe not. But we need to be praying for people. and We need to be reaching out. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you putting up with my little blowing the nose and stopping all the time because I, I am a little congested and got a little sinus headache and all that working. Uh, you guys have a great day. May God bless you. Take care.